Acts chapter 9, verse 32, all the way to the chapter's conclusion. Here there are two simple accounts of miracles wrought by Peter. One, the healing of a paralytic, and one, the raising from the dead of Tabitha, who dwelt in Joppa. Two simple accounts of Peter's miraculous works. Let's begin reading in verse 32. Now as Peter was traveling through all these regions, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. Immediately he got up, and all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, Do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. And calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. I think it would prove helpful to us to consider for a moment what we read in these concluding verses of Acts chapter 9. First, we have the reintroduction of Peter as the principal apostle. He is going to demonstrate that in the church of God, in the first century, there is still power to heal. There is power to raise from the dead. And these two miraculous healings, which Peter performs by the grace of God, will introduce us to the marvelous event of chapter 10, the opening of the gospel to the Gentile world in the conversion of Cornelius and his household. So in a sense, these two episodes introduce us again to Peter. We have not learned of his activities since Acts chapter 8 and verse 25, where he and John laid hands on the Samaritans and the Holy Spirit was given to them as a gift. We read then that Peter and John returned to Jerusalem. Often, individuals view the apostles as hide-bound traditionalists. After all, in Acts chapter 8, it says that the apostles remained in Jerusalem while the church was scattered because of the persecution of Stephen. But we learned that the apostles had an obligation to remain in Jerusalem and oversee the church. What we do learn from the first verse in our section in chapter 32 is that Peter was not at all hidebound, nor was he restricted to a ministry in Jerusalem, but that Peter himself had traveled through the lands 
of the province of Judea. That's what we read in verse 32. He was traveling through all those regions, and the word those regions refer to Lydda and the accompanying environment, and Lydda is in Judea. How do we have churches in Judea? Well, there are two answers. First, we've already alluded to Acts chapter 1, the early Acts chapter 8, the early verses. Following Stephen's persecution, you had the dispersion. Luke uses the word, the church was scattered throughout Samaria and Judea. So following that persecution, after the execution of Stephen, many of the disciples were spread throughout Samaria and Judea. Philip goes to the Samaritans, having been scattered from Jerusalem by persecution, he goes to the Samaritans, and the Samaritans are converted. Here we read that Peter, at some point, here in the narrative, verse 32, had made his way to oversee the churches that had arisen in Judea. And it is possible that the conversions that took place at Lydda, where he arrives, were because of Philip's ministry. Remember when Philip was taken away from the Ethiopian eunuch, it tells us that he went up the Mediterranean coast. And Lydda, while not a coastal city, is in the regions of Judea and on the route that Stephen would have taken proceeding northward. So the church at Lydda, which here are called saints, the church at Lydda, which are here called saints, are, are the product of the dispersed Jews from the per persecution of Stephen or the result of the evangelistic mission of Philip. But you know, when it comes down to it, we just find that there are saints at Lydda. And Peter is overseeing the church in that place, giving apostolic oversight and apostolic teaching. We remember from Acts 2 verse 41 that daily the apostles were teaching the doctrine of Christ. Well, I have said already that they, the believers, are called saints. But remember that in Acts chapter 9, there are five different descriptions, five, of believers. They are ones who are followers of the way. They are saints, as here. They are disciples, as later. They are brothers and sisters, as brother Saul. And if you look just across the page at verse 22 of this chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 21 of this chapter, they are also called those who call on this name, or those who call on the name of the Lord. So there are five different ways of describing the Christian life. Saints, disciples, brothers and sisters, followers of the way, those who call on the name of the Lord. We really do have quite a diverse heritage of descriptions of what we are when we come to believe in the Lord. And what we're going to find in these two incidents is that in both episodes of healing and raising from the dead, people are going to turn to the Lord. Or in Luke's language later, they are going to believe in the Lord. But all that returns us again to Lydda. And we find somewhat a surprising brevity in the account. We're told very simply in verse 33 that there is a man, Aeneas is a Greek name, but he appears to be a Jewish disciple. He is in the covenant community of Lydda. Once again, the scattering of the saints or the ministry of Philip has brought the gospel to Lydda. It may be helpful before we come to Joppa to remember that Lydda is a town about 25 miles northwest of Jerusalem. It is on the road to the coast where Joppa lies. Joppa is where Peter 
will raise Dorcas from the dead. So there is a line from Jerusalem northwest to Lydda, and then on another additional 12 miles to the coast at Joppa. We'll talk about Joppa a little bit when we come to Tabitha. You already know about Joppa. You think you don't, but you do. And I'll remind you that you do in just a moment. But all that to say, again, that we are in Lydda, and very briefly we're told that this man, with a Greek name but apparently a Jewish disciple, had been bedridden for eight years because he was a paralytic. Now, sometimes we think about the furniture in our home, and we think, I need new furniture. Well, in a small Judean village where Aeneas lived, the principal furniture in a home was a bed mat. That seems quite simple to us, and it does play a part in the story, but it's interesting that in poorer homes in a smaller town like Lydda, where the main production would be pottery making, linen production, wine making, pottery, I think I've said, and these types of things, the economy was not a thriving and booming um, mechanism there for generating great amounts of wealth. But what we do have is the basic unit of furniture was a bed mat. It would be rolled out, slept upon, and then when the early morning light came, the bed mat would simply be rolled up, put in a place until ready to be used that evening. Well, he is, he, that is Aeneas, our Greek-named Jewish disciple friend, is laid out on a mat. And Peter, it says, found the man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years. He was paralyzed. And Peter simply pronounces the forgiveness. This is to show, once again, that God had endowed the, the places are, Acts, are Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 9 is the mission of the 12. Luke chapter 10, the mission of the 72. In both cases, God had given to Peter and the apostles the power to heal. So Peter has the power to heal, and the scriptures tell us here that he immediately pronounces a healing. He doesn't, in this instance, pray, as he will do with Tabitha. He simply says, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And so the idea here is that there is this small domicile with a singular bed laid out on the ground. Aeneas is there, and Peter simply says the word, Jesus Christ heals you, and then to show that the healing like the healings of Jesus, is instantaneous and complete. And we have the words, Peter telling him, get up and make your bed, that is, fold up your mat. And then we have the word at the end of verse 34, immediately he got up. So the healing is instantaneous and complete. We saw that in the book of Luke when Jesus healed others. The healings were instantaneous and complete. We find that replicated here in the account of Aeneas, the paralytic for eight years. But the sum of the story is found in what Luke wants to communicate to us in verse 35. That word of this miracle by Peter spread throughout Lydda, and also throughout Sharon. Sharon is the coastal plain of the Mediterranean coast. And so this is a fertile plain. It is, it is, it is uh, uh, just above the Gaza Strip. It is where the uh, flat coastal plain moves from the southern part of Israel, all the way north, all the way up to Mount Carmel. And this also was a place 
where Philip had evangelized. But what Luke is communicating to Theophilus, remember he is writing to a Greco-Roman audience and especially to his patron Theophilus is that the miracle that P Peter does brings people to turn to the Lord. The miracle is evidence to them that God is at work in his gospel. And the result of this instantaneous and miraculous cure is that people turn to the Lord. Why? Because Luke is showing us not simply biographical information, but he is showing to us the progress of the church, how the church is expanding from Jerusalem to Samaria, which we saw with Philip and then later Peter and John, and from Samaria also to Judea. And so this miracle wrought by Peter brings the gospel increasingly to the province of Judea and particularly to the region of the coastal plain of Sharon. It's a simple, concise story Luke adds to his account to reintroduce Peter, because we have been speaking of Paul, and then to bring us back to the main point of the narrative, which is to show the church expanding and growing in Jerusalem, Samaria, and Judea. Now we come to the account of Tabitha. I do want to make a, uh, a word of recommendation about this name Tabitha. We are not seeing it used in the church yet, but it's an excellent um, name, and it means gazelle. And it communicates that the young female child who has been named Tabitha, Tabitha is Aramaic. And once again, Luke is writing to a Greco-Roman audience, and so he gives a parenthesis and says, translated in Greek, verse 36, is called Dorcas. But the word Tabitha is Aramaic, and it means gazelle. And a gazelle is considered to be a graceful animal. So it would be the idea that the Tabitha is communicating that this young woman will be graceful. But it's also used in the book, the Song of Solomon, to refer to one who is beloved. And that is certainly apt in this context because Tabitha, in Greek, Dorcas, but in Aramaic, Tabitha, Tabitha is beloved. And Luke reminds us and reintroduces us not only again to Peter, who is going to raise her from the dead as the principal apostle, but he also brings Tabitha before us as one of Luke's intent, intents to communicate the importance of charity and almsgiving. The very first thing that Luke tells us following her, the, the introduction of her name and location is that she is a woman abounding with deeds of kindness and charity. This is a characteristic which is much coveted in the believing community of Israel and also in the blooming, fledgling Christian movement. This, this adoption of the ways of charity and kindness referring primarily to the deeds of almsgiving. We're also going to find in just a little bit that she is a dressmaker. She is uh, skilled in making clothing. She is what many of us might call a seamstress. And so she abounds in a number of ways that Luke commends to the reader. She is abounding, the words abounding and continually point to the fullness of her life in abounding with kindness and doing deeds of charity. Then below we'll read 
some of the incidents in which she demonstrates her charity and her kindness. Some interpreters believe that this is evidence that she is a woman of some means, that she has some considerable wealth, and that she is. this incident is located in her house, which has an upper room. So perhaps she has, in contradistinction from Aeneas, she appears to have a spacious and generous home. She apparently opens that home to many. She has deeds of kindness and deeds of almsgiving, in other words, contributing to the needs of others who are less fortunate, the deserving poor. And then we're going to find in the passage's most emotional sentence that she is a seamstress and a dressmaker. And I'm going to add in that perhaps this story occurs during a cooler season of the year, perhaps during the winter. I'll suggest that in just a moment. Now, I said we needed to consider Joppa. Joppa is known to you because you will now remember that when Solomon built the temple in the beginning of the first millennium B.C., in the 900s when Solomon set about to construct the first temple, he took and sent in a barter agreement to have the cedars of Lebanon cut and then they were put into the Mediterranean Sea at Tyre and floated down to Joppa. So Joppa is the seaport, the ancient seaport. We have historical records of Joppa all the way back to 1500 BC. It's a long-standing seaport. It is in, still in Judea, and it is the seaport most often used by Jerusalem. It's about 25 miles from Jerusalem to Lydda, where Aeneas lived, and about another 12 miles to the seacoast town of Joppa, where not only were the cedars of Lebanon floated down to Joppa, but Joppa is also the place where Jonah caught a ship to flee from the Lord. So you may not have remembered it, but Joppa is the place where Jonah disembarked in his effort to free from the, flee from the call to the Lord to go to Nineveh. So those are several references in the Old Testament that remind us of the significance of Joppa. Later, uh, and in the next chapter, we'll find Caesarea being the port that Herod the Great built. Joppa had a very rocky coast and was somewhat treacherous in bringing vessels into that port, but it nevertheless was the seaport for Jerusalem. Later, Herod the Great builds Caesarea Maritima, which is on the coast, and that becomes the principal port. And we'll visit Caesarea when we visit Peter going to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And we are in these two incidents being reminded of Peter's principal place as having the keys to the kingdom and opening the, the door of the kingdom to the Jew, to, excuse me, to the Gentiles with Cornelius and his household in the next episode. So we're being led into Peter's place of primacy again, having spent time in chapter 9 with Paul. Paul, as I said last week, will be out of the narrative for over 10 years. Not until the end of Acts chapter 11 is Paul brought back into the narrative and it is approximately 15 years after the crucifixion. When we get to Acts chapter 11, I will detail that chronology and make, make it clear why we know we're approximately 15 years from the crucifixion when Barnabas goes to Tarsus and gets Paul and brings him back. But we thought as readers of Acts, we were getting into the biography of Paul. But that is dropped because Paul leaves Jerusalem and goes to Tarsus.
And Peter is once again, having been prominent in Acts chapter 3 through 5, having been prominent in parts of Acts chapter 8, now Peter is reintroduced to us through these two miracle stories and also introduced to the apostle Peter who opens the door to the Gentiles in the conversion of Cornelius and his household. So there is a method in Luke's madness in bringing Pete Peter into the narrative at this point. But all that to say we're at Joppa. And today, if you go to Joppa, it's almost contiguous with Tel Aviv. There's Tel Aviv and then just contiguous with that to the south is the ancient city of Joppa. And we've discussed it being the seaport for Jerusalem. There was more of a Gentile population there than there would have been at Lydda. But nevertheless, this Dorcas demonstrates to us, or Tabitha, the name I'm commending to us, the event shows that even in the believing covenant community at Joppa, they are disciples. It says in verse 36, now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, We've looked at the five names that describe believers. Here again, we're using disciple. And Tabitha is here um, introduced as this charitable woman who is an almoner, a giver of alms. And we're also introduced to the fact that even in the covenant community, there is sickness and death. We've already seen one saint, Aeneas, who is stricken with paralysis. Now we see that a good, godly woman, what we're going to call a mainstay of the church at Joppa, is taken with illness and dies. And so sickness and death do visit the believing community. And we have that in our own day as well. Even though an individual may be a, an enlightened disciple and a charitable giver and a patron of the church, nevertheless, sickness and death may visit that individual or that community in which the believer lives. And that is what happens here. It's almost, again, briefly stated in verse 37. It simply says, it happened at that time, at that time refers to at the time that Peter was in Lydda. It happened at that time that she fell fell sick and died. And then they have an interesting post-mortem reaction. They place her body, they wash her body. This is sort of shorthand for saying they purified the body. They would wash the body, anoint it with oil, and then a sort of an unusual post-mortem location They place her in an upper room. I'll have something to say about the upper room when we get to the actual raising from the dead. But the upper room here is somewhat unusual because the Jewish custom, as I think we know, was to bury the same day of death. Uh, The deceased was laid to rest before sundown on the day of his or her death. So this different way of approaching the remains of Tabitha appear to indicate one or two things, one thing, a second thing, and perhaps both. And that is first that perhaps her death took place very late in the day so that there was not time to wash, purify, and lay her to rest before sundown. But probably what is taking place here is Luke is telling us that while these things were taking place in Lydda, that is the healing of a paralytic, the community at Joppa recognizes that that took place. It tells us in verse 35, all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. So individuals in Joppa were aware of two things. They were aware that Peter was in near proximity, less than a day's walk, 12 miles. 
that Peter is in near proximity and that he has performed a miraculous deed in healing the paralytic. Therefore, it is probable that they have placed her in an upper room, washed and ready, in hopes that Peter will come and raise her from the dead. There is the hope in the Christian community of resuscitation because Tabitha will die again. She is not literally resurrected. She is raised from the dead. She lives out the rest of her years and then she dies again. So it's not the resurrection, but a raising from the dead or a resuscitation. Now, why would this be in the mental vocabulary of the saints at Joppa? Well, let's think about the broader scriptures just for a moment. We have four instances that are going to come up in just a moment or that are going to be hinted at in just a moment. In the Old Testament, Elijah, both, I should say both Elijah, 1 Kings 17, and Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 4, raise a young man from the dead. So there is in the canonical Old Testament scriptures, during the time of the reforming prophets, Elijah and Elisha, there is this awareness that the God of Israel does raise from the dead and that his prophets who have been endowed with such power, Elijah and Elisha, are able to resuscitate or raise in both cases a woman's only son from the dead. So that's in the, in, the, in the mental atmosphere, the ambient mind, there is an understanding that in the Bible, God has, does, and has raised individuals from the dead. Secondly, in the first volume of Luke Acts, in the Gospel of Luke, we already have seen Jesus raise two individuals from the dead, the widow the son of the widow of Nain, whom he raises from the dead on the funeral bier. And secondly, Jairus' daughter. So the Christian community is aware at Joppa, these who are called disciples. These disciples who are at Lydda are aware of two things. Peter is in the proximity of their community and has just performed a miracle of hearing, healing a paralytic, number one. Number two, in the old, under the old covenant, God raised individuals from the dead. And under the new covenant with Jesus Christ, they are aware that Jesus himself had raised individuals from the dead. And Luke chapter 9 and chapter 10, God had empowered his apostles with power to perform miracles. And so it would seem, and I think the, the, the best way of construing um, this location of her body and the calling of Peter, obviously those go together and they indicate the hope within the Messianic community at Joppa that Peter will raise Tabitha from the dead. They send a delegate, delegation of two men. They dispatch two men almost immediately. And they send these two men on the 12-mile trip to uh, southeast to Lydda, where Peter is and where they are aware he has healed a paralytic. It says in verse 37, it happened at that time she fell sick and died. When they had washed her body, put it, they laid it in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, do not delay in coming to us. So once again, there seems to be this, this anticipation that a miracle-working apostle of Jesus Christ is nearby and rather than rush her to the grave because of her extreme importance in the church at Joppa, they send for Peter. Plainly, I think, they are sending for Peter in hopes that he will be able to perform this miracle of restoring Tabitha to the church at Joppa. And of course, Peter is 
forthcoming. Verse 39, he arose, went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room. And here we have the most emotional scene in the chapter, or, or in this section of the chapter at any rate. And I want to sort of describe it because I think it brings us into the humanity and the reality of what the early church experienced. Here, they have just lost one of their premier members, a mainstay, a woman whose charitable deeds and generous giving has sustained the church at Joppa. She, Luke tersely says, she became ill and died. But the response is what we saw at the death of Stephen. Remember at Stephen's funeral, we were told that they made great lamentation. And I insisted at that point that although we have hope in the resurrection and although we know that our fellow disciples and our uh, fellow saints and those of us who have turned to the Lord and those of us who have called on the name of the Lord, those of us who are followers of the way, we know that we have the promise of resurrection and eternal life, but we still grieve. And when Stephen died, great lamentation was made over him. And we find a similar emotional response here at Joppa by the seaside where Tabitha lived. It says, all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas made, used to make while she was with them. The word showing, and this is a grammatical point, but it's virtually certain. The word showing is in the middle voice. And that middle voice usually has the intent to communicate one acting for oneself. Or that the, the meaning of it comes out that the garments that they were showing to Peter were the garments that they were wearing. In other words, instead of reaching into a drawer in the upper room and pulling out a tunic and saying, see what Dorcas made, they were literally taking the garments that they had and showing them to Peter and saying, Dorcas made these for us. These are tunics or garments that that Tabitha made while she was with us and they were weeping in memory of her contributions to the church. And I think that's such a poignant human scene that, that we remember the, the, the deeds of the righteous. The deeds of the righteous follow them, Proverbs and Revelation tells us. And we have that here, uh, just an, uh, an, an emotional aside by Luke in saying that these were widows who obviously were impoverished perhaps did not have the money to buy suitable clothing. And here's where the idea that perhaps it is a cooler uh, season of the year, you have the tunic as the inner garment, and then the word garment has the idea of an outward piece of clothing. Perhaps they're wearing both because the temperatures are colder. And they're saying there, perhaps in a chilled room, that look at what Dorcas made for us. These very clothes we're wearing were made by Tabitha. And they're weeping in remembrance of her and all of the kindnesses and charitable deeds which she had done, which endeared her to them. So the early church was very much like we are. We are also full of emotion and tearful response when we lose a beloved member of our church or in the Christian community when one is taken in sickness and death and we not only are saddened by that but we may have remembrances of specific deeds and, and um, charitable acts that were done and Peter is there in the midst of this emotional display of appreciation for Joppa and now he does what Jesus did in the healing of Jairus and I'm going to suggest here that what we have in the recalling of this resuscitation is somewhat informed by Elijah, Elisha, and Jesus and an imitation of Jesus because what it says is here in verse 40, 
it says that Peter sent them all out. This is precisely what we have in Luke chapter 8 and Mark chapter 5 when Jesus heals Jairus' daughter. If you will remember, he sent every, everyone was weeping and, and so forth. He sent everyone out. And Peter here, um, and we're in an upper room just like Elijah was when he raised the, the, the widow of Zarephath's son from the dead, was in an upper room. This incident is in an upper room. It seems to be Luke is, is recalling for the reader that just as God worked in the days of the reforming prophets, just as God worked in the days when Jesus was living, so God is at work today through his apostles. Jesus is still healing and raising from the dead through the work of his appointed apostles. And also the word Tabitha arise. I'm not sure if you remember. I know you remember the cedars of Lebanon coming down from Tyre to Joppa. I knew you'd remember that. I knew you'd remember that Jonah was at Joppa. I'm not as confident that you may remember Mark chapter 5 and verse 41 where Jesus addresses Jairus' daughter and he says in Aramaic, Talitha kum, Talitha, little girl, kum, arise. And curiously what we have here is only one letter's difference. Instead of Talitha, little girl, arise, G Peter here says, Tabitha, arise. There's a B instead of an L. Instead of Talitha kum, as Jesus said in, in raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, Peter says, Tabitha kum. And it almost seems to be an intentional mimicking of what Jesus did in sending out the people before he healed Jairus and then using the words Talitha kum, little girl, I say to you, arise. Here we have in Aramaic, Tabitha arise, Tabitha kum. So there seems to be a saying by Luke here again that what Jesus did while he was on earth, he continues to do through his apostles in the current age of the new covenant and the beginning years, the apostolic age of the church. And so he kneels down and prays. And I think it's important that we see again in this particular instance what is repeated elsewhere by Luke, the posture of prayer. In these times of urgency, the posture of prayer is kneeling. He sends everyone out. And the Bible says he kneels down and prays. Now, Luke chapter 22 and verse 41 in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible tells us that Jesus knelt down and prayed. Later in Acts chapter 20, when Paul calls the elders from Ephesus to Miletus and prays with them, it says they knelt down on the beach and prayed together. So we have Luke bringing up in various instances this this reverent response to, the need, to a desperate need that puts Christians on their knees to pray. So we do have prayer as a legitimate and often appropriate and one might say sometimes even necessary posture to urgent prayer. Peter puts them out, he kneels down and he prays and simply addresses her as he did Aeneas and says, Tabitha kum, or in Aramaic, Tabitha arise. And the Bible informs us almost in a lovable way. It simply says she opened her eyes just as the young boy that Elijah healed. She opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand, raised her up and calling the saints and widows he presented her alive to her wondering friends. And we can almost see this, this astonished, wondering reunion. Now what the Bible doesn't tell us, and I think you, you may be thinking, what happens between death and resuscitation? Well, we have 
We've already named four instances of that in the Bible. 1 Kings 17, 2 Kings 4, Elijah and Elisha. They resuscitate young men. What was taking place in the, in the experience of those young men between their death and resuscitation? The raising of the widow's only son from the funeral bier at Nain. What was taking place in his life between being laid out, purified, placed on the funeral bier, and taken out perhaps the same day for burial? What took place? We're not told in that incident. We're not told in the instance of Jairus' daughter what took place. The Bible simply doesn't speak to that issue. So anything we might say would be at best a conjecture, probably better labeled a speculation. And the reason I mention that is we have news accounts of people telling us what happened in their near-death experiences. Whether or not those can be trusted, I'm not in a position to make a judgment like that. I don't know. But what I do know is the Bible does not reveal what takes place. Did they, were they um, kept in sort of a soul sleep anticipating the resuscitation? Were they taken to a, a heavenly home and then returned? I think that probably is unlikely, but I don't know. And the Bible doesn't say. So what I would say is we probably shouldn't speculate and probably not invest a great deal of belief in what is told us by these um, often media-reported instances of an individual apparently dying and then hours later being resuscitated and coming back to life. Uh, apparently that does happen, and apparently in places where the gospel is, is prospering and in third world countries, it appears there are instances where people are resuscitated by Christian ministers. So I would not rule out at all this being a possibility in our age, but I would rule out the speculation because the Bible simply doesn't tell us what took place between death and resuscitation in any of those four accounts. Now we conclude with the simple statement that will prepare us for a dramatic leap forward in the narrative. It simply says, Peter stayed. Well, I should, I should say that the, the miracle of healing Aeneas and the miracle of raising Tabitha from the dead is narrated by Luke as both accomplishing the conversion of others. It says in verse 35... They turned to the Lord. It says in verse 42, many believed in the Lord. So these miracles, these two simple miracles that are recorded to introduce Peter to us for chapter 10, these two simple miracles do turn individuals. They are attesting miracles that attest to the truth of the gospel. They are effectual in producing wonder and amazement and also faith and repentance. So that in the churches of Judea, both at Lydda and at Joppa, and throughout the coastal plain of Sharon, there is a growth in the church due specifically to these two miracles that Luke records and that Peter performed prior to our introduction to Peter's wonderful trip to Caesarea, where a Gentile household has, is a recipient of the Holy Spirit. They are baptized, and Peter is taken to task for that in, uh, by, the, by many in Jerusalem in going into the home of a Gentile and baptizing Gentiles and eating with Gentiles. He is going to be criticized for that. But this chapter 9 is reintroducing us to Peter because in last verse tells us Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. And the next time we're in the book of Acts, we'll be in chapter 10, and Simon will be up on the roof praying, and guess what happens? Because it happens to you. He starts to earnestly pray, and he gets hungry. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> we set aside a time to pray, and 
and we clear our minds of everything except the stomach says, me, me, me. And we're uh, aware that although it's time to pray and we've set aside this time to pray, that we're hungry. And so it says that while they were preparing for the food, Peter was, Peter was waiting for that. And, uh, and he has this vision. And so when we come next to Acts chapter 10, should be in two weeks. Dr. Dyer will be here next week. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we'll return to this account. There's, there's, there's many interesting things. But Luke has brought us to see that in the church of the holy God... There is still the power to work miracles, and Peter works too, that produce faith and belief in Sharon, and Lydda, and Joppa. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the tears that were dried that day in Joppa, shed out of loving memory for Tabitha. We remember her just as we remember Peter's miraculous acts. We remember also the charitable and generous acts of Tabitha, that she was productive and giving within the community. And as a result, she was dearly loved and that widows had profited from her ministry in the church at Joppa. So we thank you for her memory. Thank you for the grace of God, which raised her from the dead and which presented her alive to her wondering friends. And we pray, Lord, that we might imitate Tabitha and that we would be charitable and generous and giving and that we may use skills even such as dressmaking to help and to use the skills that we have to help others who are less fortunate in your community. We look forward to hearing of the conversion of Gentiles since we are like the Ethiopian eunuch, we are Gentiles, and we are grateful that you open the door of faith and belief to us that we might believe in the Lord and be saved by his grace. We pray in his name. Amen.